We've got a lot to get through. We've got the Austrian qualifying, we've got Austrian sprint qualifying, and we've got the Austrian sprint race. I'm gonna kind of go through all this and tell you all the things that I saw in the data. And there's some pretty interesting stuff. We've had some shocks, some surprises, some really weird stuff that we're not used to seeing, but I, I, I thought it was pretty interesting. So let's start off talking about qualifying. Uh, Red Bull and Ferrari, both very strong in this session. Uh, Perez doesn't make it to Q3 because he hit track limits. McLaren, now we keep talking about the McLaren upgrades, but McLaren have had their best gap to pole position this season, which is encouraging. They're not super close yet, but it's there. Uh, Mercedes, Alpine, and Aston Martin, relatively average to underperforming. And then something's really wrong with the Aston on the brakes into turn four and three. And I'm not really sure what's going on. Like they're stand out bad relative to the rest. So we'll, we'll come back to that. So let's look at this here. Here's the qualifying performances the whole season. And like I said, Red Bull, for the exception of Baku and Canada, like this is Alex's fastest lap. It's not all the Q3 laps. It's the fastest lap. Remember, Alex got that wet lap in or the dry lap in. So I'm going to remove these eventually. But for now, we've got them there. Red Bull setting the pace pretty much everywhere. Ferrari close in qualifying, not sprint qualifying. McLaren with their best result uh, relative to pole so far, which I'm, I'm pretty thrilled about. Good for them. Mercedes... I mean, they've kind of got, I mean, they were closer in Australia and about similar at the beginning of the season. Mercedes are about the same gap to the front as they are now, but I don't think that's strictly because of a lack of performance in the car. I think they were a little bit underperforming with tire prep and traffic management yesterday. And we'll come back to that several times. Um, Aston Martin, I mean, Aston Martin have been on a little bit of a slump since Monaco in terms of gap to the front. So Spain, Canada, and Austria in terms of their gap. Um, they're quite fine. And yes, I do expect them to go well at Monaco, so on. Uh, other teams that underperformed here to normal. The, the midfield is just chaos uh, and, and randomness, honestly. So I'm not too worried about where they're looking today. Now, here's the thing that I told you guys, and I put a tweet out upon this, and people were kind of shocked by it. So when you go into qualifying, the track gets faster. It's a function of the lap. And we're talking about qualifying specifically. Max did something really weird that we don't see the other day, but it reminds me a lot of the first thing I noticed with him about his first race in Barcelona. But after that, like when we were in 2016 in Austria, I was like, this kid's going out insane. He did that thing this weekend during qualifying. So if we look at all the lap times throughout the qualifying session, you notice that everybody else is starting here around a one minute and six second lap, and they just build up to it. But look at Max here. Max only gains less than a second from the start of qualifying to the end of qualifying, whereas everybody else is doing like second and a half start to finish and that's interesting and it's let's, let's put that in perspective there's no prizes for being the fastest car in q1 but at the same time he was super confident with the car straight in he had a couple of track limits violations which all the drivers found super frustrating but he was able to lock that in and this is wild here's what that looks like in terms of telemetry and, and stick with me for just a second on this right so basically from the start of qualifying to the end of, so his first lap to his last lap in qualifying uh what did he find he found one point or just un, he found just under a second right turn one within a tenth of a second start to finish turn two within another tenth turn four he pushes the braking zone a little bit and then turn six he's only about 10 kilometers an hour down in terms of top speed turn nine he takes a little bit of margin but not really losing that much time and that's super interesting if you compare that to leclerc who arguably probably had some traffic and took it very easy and red bull were doing something pretty clever with their qualifying which i don't think very many people appreciate and we'll talk about that but here's how much time leclerc gained. so this is the same scale here um this is an issue with the data so don't look at that but in terms of how much time he leaves on the table and how much he builds up to it because you don't you don't get a prize for going out in pole position in q1 right a couple tenths here a couple tenths here but like huge like 20 kph down through turn six 15 through turn seven 20 through turn nine another 15 kph through turn 10. so it just goes to show you that max was really on it with the car this weekend if you want to go back you can pause that and look at those two things but realistically if we get into the qualifying laps uh, let's look at the performance overall for this session right Let's look at the gaps from everybody in this session. We'll step back to that now. Um, here's everybody, fastest driver per team. Uh, Ferrari within a sniff of pole, really close. We'll go look at Leclerc and Verstappen's laps. Norris, another really good qualifying result within four tenths or 0.4%. 4, uh, Mercedes on the struggle bus at 0 0.6 and everybody else behind them as well. Alpha Tauri underperforming, Alfa Romeo underperforming, Albon doing typical good job for Albon in that car I think and 
yeah i still don't think the williams is a particularly great car but he seems to be often getting the most out of that car so that's the the qualifying pecking order for this session um in terms of best sectors not a whole lot stands out here i think if checo had put in a better sector and got the lap together he would have been easily fine but still quite a far way off of Verstappen even with best sectors nothing else really changes other than that maybe if people put their best sectors Akon could have uh, popped Piastri maybe but not really much to say and I, I think we're starting to see that maybe McLaren is finding a trajectory back towards the front uh I'm not really sure nothing to stand out in terms of top speeds uh but yeah let's have a quick look at Leclerc versus Verstappen and Verstappen Verstappen versus Norris. And this is there's actually not a whole lot in between the the Ferrari and the Red Bull that I've noticed. And I, th I think this is a good comparison. I will go there, that one. So through turn one, here's car speed. And this is the start of the lap. And this is the end of the lap over here on the right. Um, are you guys saw my notes? Cheaters. Um, here's car speed here. Red is the clear, blue is Verstappen. Here's the throttle trace. And we'll come back to the throttle. There's something really interesting about the throttle. And here's the time delta. When it goes towards the top, Verstappen's faster. When it goes towards the bottom, Leclerc is faster. So throughout the whole lap, all the way down to turn four, Verstappen and Leclerc are within, uh, you know, two hundredths of a second, super duper close. So that you see the track dominance graphic. That is such a stupid graphic because it doesn't make any sense at all. And it's not scaled to anything. I keep seeing F1 post that and other people post it. It's such a stupid graphic and it doesn't make any sense. So it's you look at the time series and you just take a small second to understand where people are faster, or slower. It makes a lot more sense. Um, within a couple hundreds of each other throughout up to turn four, Leclerc finds a lot of speed on the brakes into turn four. He's able to carry a lot more speed in. Uh, he ends up about 500s ahead. Now, here's the interesting thing about the Red Bull and Ferrari that's different in the high speed. Leclerc carries a little bit more entry speed in and backs up slower and gets on throttle. But look at this. The Ferrari have to carry a lot of throttle through the high speed corners. And the only thing that comes to mind immediately is the fact that the Ferrari looks like it has quite a bit of front end in it. And in order to keep the car stable, you apply some throttle to make the car slightly more understeer. Whereas if the Red Bull had gone on throttle in turn six and seven, I reckon they would have understeered off the track. Um, the same the same for turn nine and 10. The Ferrari, a little bit more speed on the way into nine, holding some throttle on there. Same on 10, holding some throttle. But Leclerc loses out as he gains a lot of time all the way up to the apex of turn 10. But if you look at this, he carries a little bit too much speed into turn 10, compromises his exit. He has to back out of the throttle. And whereas, let's say at turn nine, he's a couple hundreds ahead. By the exit of turn 10, he's 500s behind. So a super, super close qualifying. And that's about as close as they're going to get. So let's look at Norris quickly as well, because this is really not a bad lap from uh, the McLaren at all. Norris doing an excellent job. I just wish he was in a faster car out of the box. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Uh, can we do that one? No, we'll do this one. So uh, pretty strong. I would say the Red Bull's a little bit faster in a straight line everywhere, but we're talking about uh, two hundreds down to turn one in terms of straight line. Uh, another couple hundreds down to turn three. Um, through the corners, not bad. He's Lando is similar pace to Max through the corner. Max gains on the entry, loses on the exit. Similar pace to where they started going through the corner. Same for turn three. Max carries a little bit more speed in. Lando gets a slightly better exit out. Max gains just a little bit through that sequence. Not much. Then into turn four, Lando very very strong here he carries he carries a lot of rolling speed through turn four and is able to carry a lot of speed through up to six so lando gains back a couple hundreds there and then through turn six and seven their car speeds look quite similar uh, but max is slowly gaining through those segments and again we see the same thing that happened to leclerc lando finds a lot of time into nine carries a lot of speed in compromises his entry to turn 10 and is he goes on throttle like you know 50 meters or more later and lose his time lando could have been probably if he'd changed up this compromise what you could do is you slow down turn nine and focus on the exit of turn 10 and i reckon lando would have been just shy of two tenths behind rather than just over just nearly three tenths so not not bad from the mclaren there uh in terms of other comparisons uh perez perez to verstappen Perez just lost out a lot of lap time in turns six, seven, and nine, ten. So he obviously had a lot of track limits there. Uh, and he got popped by track limits again, but he was taking a lot of margin in nine, ten, but also not particularly fast through seven. A little bit more conservative than Max was through the rest of the lap. I mean, he's still down about two tenths, which was about where Lando was. So I think Checo not particularly 
thrilled about the car this weekend. And if you give me just one second, we'll switch over to sprint qualifying. But if anybody has any questions, uh, I'll try and come back to them. Um, and if you're enjoying this kind of data, I'm going to leave a link in the just YouTube description below. It's uh, buy me a coffee. It's like Patreon. It's where I publish these reports in detail with a lot of written explanations. And often we'll do some deep dives into certain aspects of the Formula One season um, to, to help explain that stuff for you guys a little bit more. Um, and if you're in the Twitch chat live right now, there's a link there. And if you check that out, I'm publishing every qualifying and every race. I'm doing a detailed breakdown report of this for the price of a coffee per month. So I feel like there's a lot of value in there and it's something that helps support me. And uh, I'm giving you guys some content that nobody else is doing with, without any of the expert commentary. Um, and I feel like hopefully I'm making Formula One a lot more enjoyable uh, and educational and giving you a lot more informed takes and not just telling you what I think might be happening. So let's get into the sprint shootout session. And this is um, my, my over, overriding summary for the session. Hulkenberg is the only one that goes faster than he did in the regular qualifying session. Everybody else about the same or slower. So let's look at that. This is this is actually kind of wacky. So you notice Verstappen goes a little bit slower. Here's free practice one. Here's qualifying and here's sprint qualifying. And here's all the team's paces. Red Bull goes just slightly slower. Haas goes slightly quicker in the sprint qualifying, but Ferrari dropped the ball massively. McLaren a little bit slower. Mercedes and Alfa Romeo absolutely dropped the ball and Mercedes and Alfa Romeo go slower in sprint qualifying than they did in free practice one, which to me tells me two things probably. Conditions and tire preparation were still problematic for them, A, or they struggle with the track position and, and getting a clean lap. And we saw that Lewis had his, it, you know, it had the thing with Max where they were basically blocking each other on accident, but that is completely outlap management that is up to the race engineer to manage. And it was not clean. It, it tracks like this. You have to give your driver the best shot of getting a clear lap. And when you leave it that tight, it's it's gonna get messy. So I it's difficult, I understand it, but that's super tricky. Um. Yeah, there's not a whole lot going on in this session. Like if we look at the session pace, just this session alone, um, there's the gap. So Verstappen, Norris, again, close, but Norris only 0.9% off. He was a lot closer in um, in regular the regular qualifying session. Mercedes underperformed. They, their performance is definitely somewhere up here. Uh, Albon also not great. So interesting session in terms of management. I don't think there's a whole lot to say about it. Um, let's look at Red Bull just between what was the difference between their laps and qualifying and sprint qualifying, just to give you an idea of how much Max got out of it uh, across these sessions. So this is Max and sprint shootout in blue and Max and qualifying versus red. In the sprint shootout, Max finally figured out turn four. There were quite a few drivers that got a better run into turn four than him. I mean, he finds over a 10th on the brakes into turn four, loses out a little bit there in the kink through five. Um, and then he's just a little bit slower throughout this. He gets a worse run out of turn seven from car positioning and probably a couple hundred slower through turn nine and turn 10. So realistically, Max getting quite a bit out of the car. Um, and let's look, let's look at Mercedes, how they struggled because obviously they, they got knocked out quite earlier and they were very slow, but in terms of track ramping up and where they were struggling compared to their fastest at the end, of uh from qualifying to sprint qualifying just grip everywhere and some of this is track condition because they got knocked out quite early if i recall that correctly but i mean this is look at that and that's just traffic and not clear gap i think i think but a messy session and it emphasizes the importance of track position and getting gaps let's have a look at the sprint race before we get into the race watch along we got 20 minutes before the grand prix starts and if you're not familiar we do qualifying and race watch alongs on Twitch. I go live an hour before every session, and then we'll jump straight into qualifying a race watch along. And today is the Austrian Grand Prix, which we're watching live over on Twitch. So if you're on YouTube watching this later, do be sure to uh, stop by, drop us a follow on Twitch and come say hi next time. All right, so let's look at the sprint race quickly. Uh, my notes from the sprint race. Verstappen and Perez have a little bit of a tangle on laps one getting their elbows out. Half of the field swap from intermediate around lap 16. Um, it's only a 24 lap race, so it's very close to the end, but the track was drying rapidly. And we'll look, we'll talk again about tire crossover. Verstappen clears Perez and the entire rest of the field by 20 seconds on a suboptimal intermediate, but that was still the fastest strategy for the race leaders. Hulkenberg up front for the first third of the race, but falls back 
uh, and converts early to a soft tire and does okay with it. Russell goes early to the soft. He's very bold saying, team, give me the soft tire. Let me see what I can do. Um, he tries to make a move from P11. Hamilton goes a few laps later, but they just miss out on the points. And I wonder if Albon could have kept it on the intermediate if he had stayed out. So if we look at what the tires look like for everybody, here's the tire plans that people run. And if you want to zoom into this or pause it later on YouTube, feel free. Uh, Verstappen, Perez stay out. Hamilton, here's the guys that convert. And basically, everybody that stays out at the front. Well, this is, this is a lot easier to look at. Let's just watch it. Look at it this way. Here's 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 the race trace and here's the gaps. So here's Verstappen leading the race. Here's Hulkenberg in P2. And then he falls back, uh, back down to third, fourth, fifth or fourth. That's fourth. Counting is counting is difficult sometimes, guys. Uh, and then he's he's on the struggle bus. He's about to get eaten up by the Astons and he pits in for the soft and comes back and finishes just in that bunch. But everybody up here basically that's hanging on, they stick out on the inter despite the fact that the track is w into the well into the dry past crossover. And it's just that compromise. Um, Perez struggles as well after the race start. He gets his elbows out. Perez gets a great start. But you see a lot of the people pushing here and, and Russell pushing quite early to go for that soft uh, tire. And I think he makes it work out okay. And here's here's the here's the thing. Here's the lap times for the whole, here's the lap time for the whole race. So here's every, every slice is a lap. So here's the start of the race. Here's the end of the race. And you can see here, Max putting in much faster lap times than the entire field. And then right here, Russell puts on an enter and it's like, okay, that's about, or he puts on a wet, sorry, dry. Russell puts on the dry here. And these lap times are about the same as the enters on his first lap. And then the second lap, well clear. So the track was just about ready when he did it. And I don't think they could have switched any sooner or he was just being super cautious. But I think the track was ready right here. You can see, uh, is this Piastri or Norris? This is Piastri going out as well. And his first lap on the slick is very fast. So maybe this was the crossover lap right there. And you can see the people staying out versus the people go in. I mean, we're talking several seconds a lap difference in terms of lap time, but track position is key. Track position is key. And you can see these people that, that struggled a bit on their tire, but they didn't give up track position. Whereas you can see the Hulk coming through. Uh, he gets Norris and is that Ocon here? And Russell comes through and he gets, uh, this is the, the photo finish. This is the photo finish, we missed it. But yeah, I mean, I think the sprint, honestly, let's, let's talk before we wrap up, let's talk about the sprint and what the sprint showed me what I think Formula One needs. I think Formula One, I don't wanna say give the cars shittier tires or less grip, but when you have low grip, relatively more power you don't need the drs because you're more reliant on track positioning it's easier to make mistakes and all of that so you know the, a lot of the drivers are pushing against uh no tire warmers because imagine no tire warmers is like having like a slippery crappy conditions for the first couple laps of your stint which will make for interesting races but i feel like more power less grip less downforce less drag you're gonna have longer braking distances I, I think it could be what it needs. I, I honestly genuinely think that the V6 in 2026 is gonna be, you're gonna have a Formula E style racing in several races unless they make huge changes to it. But I think that's it for the, let's look at the, the race starting grid quickly. And there's some changes to the race starting grid. So here is the race starting grid for Stappen, Leclerc, Sainz, Lando, Lewis, L Stroll, Alonzo, Hulkenberg, Gasly, and Albon in the top 10. Kevin Magnussen is starting from the back, and DeVries is starting from the back. Uh, Kevin has changed his suspension setup, so he's like, well, we're not doing so great, so we're just going to go to the back and start over. Uh, Nick DeVries has taken a new energy store, a new control electronics, and he's also changed his suspension and the rear wing configuration. So potentially DeVries going to a low downforce set up to the race and an interesting question that snags just brought up can you go over the medium versus um the soft in the sprint the medium and the soft in the sprint so it looks like some teams did not have a new soft so they decided to fit a new medium over a scrub soft and it wasn't too bad so that's that's the last note on that uh don't forget to like and subscribe on your if you're on youtube and do be sure to check out the buy me a coffee link below see you soon